Okay, so I bring you today 15 stories are from different Madagascar grasses, just to illustrate the grass diversity across Madagascar. Um, I try to avoid complicated botanical jargon. Okay, so it's my pleasure to introduce you to Fatakamanga. On my first ever trip to Madagascar in 2011, um, we go to Andrew National Park. So this is uh, Dr. Frank Rafatnafol. Um, and this is a weird green blue grass. And then in Andringitra, the MNP and our guides, nobody knew what it is. It's Patakamanga. It didn't really flower. Complete mystery. Um, and uh, this is the Madagascar grass story number one. Uh, Patakamanga is Lycanthella madagascariensis. It makes only a very small number of flowers very rarely. At the very apex of its inflorescence, it produces a single seed. It falls down very quickly, so it's not possible to collect the seed or seed banquet. We see constant DNA, and we can see that Lycanthella madagascariensis is an ancient phylogenetic relic. Um, so saccharum group, sugar cane, and maize evolved approximately 20 million years ago from Lycanthella. So Lycanthella occurs nowhere else in the world, only in the Andrinica Mountains, and it's an ancestor of modern food. So this will be the format for my talk, 15 grass stories. I begin with the Latin name, then we have the Malagasy name. But then I try to select which of my Malagasy colleagues contributed the most to the collaboration to work with us. And then I have the geographical part of Madagascar and I have the Okay. So let's see how quickly I can get through this number. So Likam Teller was already in Madagascar 20 million years ago before people arrived. And 10 million years ago, the Aristide group evolved. So Corona, Aristide repetence. I think every one of you has seen this grass many, many times because the highland of Madagascar in the grass season, it's covered in very dry bushes like this. Um, and in the ecological classification of grasses, we call it a resistor. Fire, it's very happy with fire. Grazing, it's very happy with grazing. It sits very hard on the ground. It has a strong root system. Um, so Aristide Refessens and Kuruna, it tells us that many people thought that there are no important endemic grasses in open Madagascar highlands. But these species, they grow in open highland. They cover a lot of the country. They were here 10 million years ago before people ever arrived. And they provide strong evidence that before people arrived in Madagascar, we had open grassland, probably with fire and probably with grazing too. Okay. It's my pleasure to introduce you to grass number three, Kelly Mainzi, otherwise known as Stipia Chloa. Um, so I just came back from Fandriana, and this is the grass, which is very common up in the Fandriana Highlands. So a lot of paleo research in Madagascar relies on the difference between C3 and C4 grasses. And all the paleo researchers think, of course, the paradigm is in the forest, it's C3. In the open grassland, it's C4. But the grasses, they don't read paleo research papers. So the grasses don't know about this division. This grass is C3. Um, it covers a lot of big open granite insole bergs in southern Madagascar. It leaves a C3 signature but it's an open canopy dominant species. So maybe paleontologists need to do a little bit of grass taxonomy sometimes. Yeah. Okay. Okay, at the end of this talk, there will be a test. I'm going, everybody will vote for their favorite Madagascar yeah. grass. <clears throat> so please be ready. <laughs> um, okay, so please raise your hand if you recognize this. Kuruna, or Lodicea simplex. 
Yeah. Okay. Okay. No. Okay. Maybe. Maybe. Maybe ten people recognize it. So, um, if you drive up a few hundred north to Ankafabet and near Amboisanthe, we see big open brown grassland, and it's dominated by the perennial grass that uh, Cedric knows very well. <laughs> um, and uh, at the moment, Chana Almari is also doing her MSc on this grass. Um, when Peria de la Bathy established a lot of the basis for our knowledge of the Madagascar environment. And at the start of the 20th century, he published a list of invasive non-native grasses. And on the list, he says that Hurna is from Africa. It's an invasive grass which covers secondary grassland. So I'm not going to present our molecular research in detail here um, because it's currently going through publication process and journals. Um, but we sequenced many populations of Ludicia simplex. And now we're assembling a complete genome and we're in the process of doing a landscape genomics research. So I can tell you 100% definitely Ludicia simplex was in Madagascar a long time before people. Um, these are the plastid and nuclear genetic clusters of its diversity. These are the morphological clusters of its diversity. So, story number four, a grass which is not endemic doesn't mean it's bad. Um, like for me, the, maybe the culture of botany in Madagascar, people assume that endemics are good, we must protect the endemics. And things that are not endemic, like, ugh, who cares about them? But for grasses, it's not true. Okay. Okay, so uh, please raise your hand if you eat body rice today already. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so please raise your hand if you like to do body miena. Yeah. <laughs> it has a really good taste. I'm a big fan of body miena. Um, and you know, the, um, Rice research has a big separate international community. It's a um, uh, complicated science of its own right, the study of rice. And uh, they do genetic sequencing on Varimena. And there's some very interesting results that are not published yet. So um, there are many different cultivars, varieties, and genotypes of Varimena. And some of them, the international community called the Rocco rice. And they think so, and people bring rice to Madagascar, maybe 1,500 years ago, something like this. So 1,000 years ago, he picks up some genes from a rice of longestaminata. So native Malagasy weeds, a rice of longestaminata, when we drove across Tana today, in the rice paddies, there are big white inflorescences. It's a native Malagasy wetland grass. It hybridizes with a rice of hyper. And it creates by the men and rojo rice. It's a complicated genetic hybrid and it's completely unique to Madagascar. And it has great potential for income, for future economic development, for exploration. Okay, so we speak about rice and now we speak about weeds in rice cultivation. Um, so this project is done by Nancy and Fenitra. Do you want to wave? Yeah. <laughs> so this is a <laughs> Sorry. no problem. Um, the digitaria grasses. This one is called Pandrutarana. Um, they're very complicated taxonomically. And digitaria humbertii is the most economically damaging weed across the highlands. Um, they grow across dry cultivation. Um, they take away a lot of the fertility away from the food crop production. And this endemic grass was already there when people arrived in Madagascar to begin rice cultivation. So, and in this project, we are hoping to develop methods to control the weeds better by really understanding the identity of the species. OK, 
okay? Oh, please raise your hand if you recognize this. Yeah, okay, very familiar. So this is endemic to Madagascar, the nearby islands. Um, and I'm very surprised that on Mauritius, they call it Gazon Chinois. <laughs> It definitely doesn't occur in China. Um, so this is one of Madagascar's forage grasses. Um, it makes a very beautiful lawn and it makes a very dense mat and it produces forage um, for all kinds of grazing animals. And when we see a grass like this all over the Mbazas, it's evidence of ancient grazers that ate this grass before people arrived in Madagascar. So, and it really loves zebu, yeah? Zebu like Brachiara umbellata and Brachiara umbellata really likes zebu. <laughs> <laughs> okay, number eight. Um, uh, this is work by uh, Andrea Rokotnasolo. Mm -hmm. you want to? <laughs> I'm going to embarrass you. <laughs> um, so for many years, uh, People thought that all of these bamboos in the east of Madagascar are introduced from Asia. And it's true that in Zimbazas, bamboos of Ulgar, the big yellow bamboos, mm -hmm. they are definitely from Asia. Mm -hmm. And in 98, so only 20 years ago, mm -hmm. my colleague and Hugh realized that actually these bamboos are endemic, are endemic to Madagascar. So the common name is Balia. It's now called Valia diffusa. And when we work in the east of Madagascar to study the bamboos, uh, we can see that people grow and they sell bamboos for making roofs, for making houses, for many practical projects. <laughs> and this Malagasy species, it's more expensive than the Asian bamboos of Ogar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, because Valia diffusa produces columns of just the right size, to split easily and to make a very nice table and make a very nice house mm -hmm. and make a very nice wall. Mm -hmm. um, but the Asian bamboos, which are bigger and stronger and thicker, it's very really difficult to cut, so the price is lower. So to me, this is an example. The native Malagasy plant and endemic Malagasy plant, they're deeping the foreigners. Mm -hmm. But people don't realize. <laughs> Okay, uh, number nine, it's uh, Harabu. Um, uh, this is uh, another another audience participation issue. Um, who owns a mat or a basket, a little bit like this? Yeah. <laughs> so traditionally in Madagascar, <laughs> the majority of mats and baskets are made from Cyperaceae. The family Cyperaceae is different from grass, it's different from the family Poaceae but some of them are made from grasses. Um, you can see when you look very closely at the mat, the ones made from Tarabella, they're made in the Fandriana area. Um, and they have a really beautiful combination of leaves of different shades. Um, so they're woven in the Fandriana area. They're imported to Pana, and it's a big commercial enterprise. Um, but on the trip last week, we became a little bit worried about the native populations because with the expansion of agriculture, but there is a natural highland grassland, which is close to Marolambi National Park. Um, and the habitat is really decreasing for these species and they're becoming threatened. Okay, so number nine. Okay, so now we transport ourselves to the Jumbo supermarket in Uncle Rano. Raise your hand if you've been to Jumbo. <laughs> yeah. So next time you go to Jumbo, uh, please look at the tourist decorations. Yeah. And maybe you will find so this grass, Lazarac is killed the branch here. It has green branches like this. Um, originally, it was completely white. So it doesn't have a Malagasy name because maybe it didn't used to have a Malagasy use. But yeah, so ancient grasses are in the supermarket. <laughs> OK, 
Okay, number 11, Mainviti or Imparata Cylindrica. So Madagascar is famous for its big hot fires. And a lot of the fires are partly created and propagated by this grass. It can raise the temperature of the fire to above 500 degrees Celsius, especially when it makes a big monotypic stand. It's easy to recognize so it has big fluffy white panicles. Mm -hmm. And when it doesn't flower, it has red tips on its leaves and it spreads very fast. It makes 3,000 seeds, sometimes in one of the resins. When you try to dig it up, every piece of rhizome that you break will make a new plant. So this grass is resistant to herbicides. Um, and it's part of the fire propagation cycle. Yeah. So when people who try to prevent fires don't like this grass. It's a good example of how long time in the evolution of the grasses, grasses evolved at the same time as grasslands. Um, so grasses have special compounds that make fire stronger, that make fire happen more easily. So, and grasses like yeah. this, they like fire because fire burns the competition. Yeah, so my Viti, it makes the fire, the fire destroys the trees, then the grass can spread. The grass wants to make more fire, which can destroy the competition. Um, a big mystery in Madagascar at the moment is here, everybody is worried about lost forests because of fire, yeah? So in Madagascar, people always say, grasslands are increasing with fire and forests are decreasing. But in South Africa, we see exactly the opposite. Um, in South Africa, my colleagues call it bush enroachment. So out of the forest, the trees come and people are very worried about losing their grassland because all of the antelopes and all the animals that eat grasses in Africa, like bush and woody vegetation, it's very bad for the animals. So it's bad for conservation. So in South African national parks, grasses like this are very popular and flies are good. <laughs> okay. Okay, fires are good, but sometimes fires are not good. Uh, so number 12 is a little bit of a sad example. Sartidia perrieri. There is no photo on this slide because nobody alive today has ever seen this plant. Um, we know only one collection in 1940 near Ansira Bay at 1,900 meters. We visited every single location near at 1,900 meters. Um, and you know, Ansira Bear has a large population and a lot of human activity, and Tartidia doesn't cope with fire. So if a pyrogenic grassland overtakes its habitat, probably grows on rocks. So what we think most likely has happened is it's, it's gone. Okay, number 13 is another sad story. Um, and we do this work with uh, Nancy Nyman. Do you want to wave, Nancy? Yeah. <laughs> um, so Nancy did her MSc work in Ishalo National Park. And in Ishalo, there is this bamboo. And the local people value this bamboo very much. And they collect it. And they use it for building material. But the problem is, we don't know what to call this bamboo. Um, so the bam all of the bamboo taxonomy experts and me and Yangri, we look at the morphology, but it doesn't fit any of the genera. Um, and then the sequence of DNA, it doesn't fit anything in our phylogenetic tree. And bamboos like this, often they flower maybe once every 100 years. So maybe we have to sit under the bamboo and wait for 100 years until it flowers. But for now, you know, part of the problem is botanical tradition and botanical convention because taxonomists like me, we need flowers. And the definition of flowers is really the definition of the classification of the genus and the species. It has no flowers. We don't know what it's called. So Ishalo MNP is missing from the flora list 
Um, when we look at statistics of the flora of Madagascar, it doesn't yeah. exist at all. So unless we have more taxonomists and more taxonomic work to describe diversity like this, we can't protect it. Okay, we're on to number 14. And um, please close your eyes and imagine that you're transported to Majonga. Okay, close your eyes for a few minutes. Okay, you're in Majonga and you see this really small grass. It grows in the muddy wetland. So anytime there is like secondary vegetation, abandoned fields, uh, there's some like salty mud. It's a very small grass. Like the flowers are a little bit like rice. It has long horns. It's only very small. Um, and for many years, we were worried it was extinct. Lysia perrieri, it's an extremely rare rice relative. Um, and my colleague, uh, Dr. Augusto Butovao Rami Andrisu at the University of Majonga, he actually succeeded in finding it. It was part of the MBG Wetland Conservation Project. Um, now at the University of Majunga, they start a new botanical garden. Um, August collected the seed and they have a new ex situ conservation program to propagate the material. And we want to sequence it and we want to see does it have any useful genes for improvement of rice. Okay, we're nearly there. Last one. Okay, last one is my favorite. And last one is. So this is a Kemba sorghum, and uh, and this is Romaine Benjamina um, in a travel protected area. So Romaine is about the same height as me, and this sorghum is uh, so I think in this room the sorghum will almost reach the ceiling. Yeah. So this sorghum shows us the power of grasses to really make food very quickly on poor soil. Um, in Inferno, the soil is poor, and so it's very difficult for the zebu to have enough food. There's a livestock nutrition problem, and on many zebu, you can see the ribs. And when you see the ribs on the zebu, it means that they're quite malnourished. It's not a good thing. Um, and in the project, we try to use the native grassland. Um, so we have so and so Nandrisu. Please wave, Nanj. Yeah, so Nanj is working on this project if you have questions later. Um, using only the native grasses, it's not possible to have productive agriculture. And um, I'm very unhappy actually with conservation professionals that I work with sometimes because many, many botanists and taxonomists in conservation, they say we must only use native plants. We must only use local biodiversity. But using local and native plants, it can't feed people in a tremor. Priority number one, it must be to lift people out of poverty and to increase the production of the area. So if the local people have more food and if the local people have more zebu, then they can really engage with the tremor protected area and they can think about conservation and they can maybe value the lemurs later on. But in the first instance, we need to have more food and for this reason, we make the decision to import. So this is a commercial cultivar from South Africa. Um, and Akemba, it's native to Africa. And Akemba sorghum, it's a big success of the African continent. You know, in the grass family, we have rice comes from Asia, sugarcane and tokigasi. Tokigasi, <laughs> tokigasi comes from New Guinea. Sugarcane is from New Guinea. Um, we eat maize. And maize comes from Mexico originally. Mm -hmm. So Akemba, it's the only important and productive grass which comes from Africa mm -hmm. all across. Um, and of all the commercial grasses, it can tolerate the driest conditions. So when it's very dry and when the soil is bad, it can still make a plant which is nearly as tall as the ceiling. It's a very amazing plant. So, and we're going to go there in two days and watch the progress of the project. But we're using this to feed the zebu. We're using this to make silage on silage. And uh, yeah, hope to boost production. Okay, so, so number 15 is hope for the future. <laughs> okay. And uh, I, I want to finish with this picture, which uh, 
uh, this picture was taken in Kew in 2017. So Royal Botanic Gardens Kew, why is the British organization here in Madagascar? So in this picture, you can see um, ex-president Raja Narayana here. You can see Dr. Helen Rani Manana here representing Kew Madagascar. And uh, this is me on the air. <laughs> and we can organize so that you scientists working in Madagascar can explain directly <laughs> to Rajanari Mampi and Nina what is important about Madagascar biodiversity. So it's important that we acknowledge you is historically a very colonial organization. Um, we built a lot of the plant classification for the paleotropics for Africa, for India, for Australia, for Americas, because the whole world is by plants in Kew. And as a result, we have a lot of post old connections. So now we try to make those connections and use them for something in the future. So Rajan Ariman came in, he, he's a really big fan of David Attenborough. And the David Attenborough lives in London near Kew. So he visited get to meet David Attenborough. And uh, we talked him about Malagasy grasses and biodiversity and conservation.